Word. We're going to be reading this morning from John chapter 14, verses 15 to the end of the chapter. Hear God's word to us today. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, another counselor, another advocate to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while in the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Let's pray. Father, we have read your word. Now let your word read us, please. Speak to us in ways that only you can through the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, the words that I say are nothing apart from what you might would, would do in our hearts, our ears, our minds to understand and, and take them to, to ourselves to hold and to, to grasp and to love. Father, I pray, Lord, that as I speak these, these words, these truths, I trust that they are from your throne and from your inspiration. And if they are not, I pray that they would not be heard. But Lord, to that end, I do pray that they would encourage the body of Christ, that they would challenge us in our walk of faith, that if we're weak or we're um, not strong in our faith right now, that they would, would bring us to a place to see that we need to grow in our faith. And Lord, should there be those here this morning among us who are not Christian? They've never committed their life to Christ. They've never been born again by the blood of Christ. Would you speak to them? Speak to their heart to show them their need for Jesus? Lord, order our, our thoughts today. Honor us with your presence. And I'll thank you for that in advance. In Jesus' name I would pray. Amen. You may be seated. I hope you heard uh, to some degree, and I meant to mention this before I read it, and I didn't, so I'm not going to reread it, but I hope you heard some exclusivity of Christ for his own, that you would hear some of his promises that he was going to be unfolding for those disciples and those around him, and then as a result to us even today. Well, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. As Jesus begins his Sermon on the Mount, it's not a coincidence that he began with the Beatitudes. It's all in the alignment of God's will, providence, and plan. Because these Beatitudes will lay the foundation upon which the remaining teachings will find their root. A peacemaker, Jesus says, is one who is blessed. One who is blessed by God. Being peacemakers, my friends, is an active, intentional service for the believer, for all believers. We're called upon as Christians to be men and women of reconciliation, that we would be used of God to restore, as it were, those who, and especially the believers, 
to bring them back to relationship, those who are at odds with one another, those who are not on the same page, as it were, to be a, a reconciliatory person, to bring them together, that they would together, again, experience a peace between themselves that would honor God and glorify that relationship that he wants them to be in by the power of his Holy Spirit. When it comes to reconciliation, there are many things that we are called to do for it or in it in the lives of others around us, especially within the church body here this morning. But we're never ever commanded to give them peace because we can't. We can't give them peace. We don't have that ability. We talked about ability this morning in Sunday school. We do not have the ability to give someone peace. All we can do is lead them to the God of peace through the scripture, through prayer, through discipleship. But we should feel the weight of this opportunity nonetheless so that Christ's peace will be manifested in their lives. Don't you want that for those who are not living in Christ's peace to know Christ's peace? Especially those who are at odds with one another, much less at odds with God. We want that, see that in their lives. Peace, true peace, biblical peace, like hope we learned last week, is from God. It's not something we can do. Jesus tells us here that peace is for us and advocating to those around us to bring them back together. And it's not at all like that which the world desires. The world's peace is different, totally different than what we have to offer. The, the world might try to bring those who are at odds against each other or opposing each other back together in different ways. We have a, a, a more of a cemented peace because it comes from God and God alone. You see, the peace that we have, we must realize that this is indeed a state of being. It's a mindset, as it were, that is not dependent on life circumstances. The world's peace is dependent upon world's circumstances that they faced with. It's not simply a lack of war or animosity. It can be that, but it's much more than that. And Jesus describes it for us here in John chapter 14 and in John chapter 16. And there are other verses throughout the scriptures that talk about peace, God's peace. Because it's so much more than a fluctuating emotion or some word that we would describe freedom from war. This idea of peace, God's peace, the peace that Jesus says is his. Neither is peace like an article of clothing that we only put on in circumstances that are certain to us, that we feel like we need to pull that out of the closet and experience peace because this is just so overwhelming, I can't take it anymore in my life. Or we put on a garment of peace to protect us from hurt. It's not something we can work up. It's not something we can manipulate within ourselves to remedy any fear, anxiety that we might be expecting or experiencing. You see, this hope or this peace that we're talking about is more than a desire of the mind, though it is that. It's more than that. The peace that Jesus speaks about here, it can be traced throughout his entire life as he interacted with peace destroyers all around him, those of his own kind, his enemies of all kinds, spiritually, physically, destroying peace, but not Christ's peace. It could not be destroyed. For his peace sustains and strengthens and guides our decisions, and of course it glorifies God. If you're experiencing God's peace this morning, you're glorifying God in that experience because it's his gift to you. How is it? Because as its root, its source, it's complete and it's a constant trust in the sovereignty, the providence, the will of God, in his grace and his mercy and his actions as one who is sovereign over all things. See, that's what this peace ultimately is. And I could say this and we could walk out and you probably would like me to do that sometimes, but this peace is just trusting in God's sovereignty. That is over our, our daughter's experience in North Carolina this morning or the death of a loved one or someone's in the hospital. His sovereignty is ruling over all of those things. And when we trust that, we experience a peace that is unlike anything you can have in this world. 
It has its roots in the constant trust in God's grace and mercy and his sovereign action in our lives. And this is not ultimately where your peace lies. My friends, I have a, a little warning here. The enemy is, is able to devour any peace you say you have. He can take it from you. And he can replace what you call peace, if you're not experiencing this peace, and replace it with fear and anxiety and joylessness, often leading to us experiencing sin because we ultimately trust in something other than God himself. So you don't, you don't trust in the circumstance. You don't even trust in the result of the circumstance. You trust in the God of the circumstance. Therein is where you'll find peace. When we submit totally to God's sovereign rule, his power and his design for us, we bring him glory. And, they, and, and we know Christ's peace, which is pretty amazing. It's the peace that led him to Calvary. It's the peace that in the Garden of Gethsemane he could say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. I trust the sovereign hand of my Father, and I'm at peace. And I trust that when we finish here this morning that you and I will be at least a little bit, have a little bit more of a fresh desire to have a deeper Christ-like peace that will cover our walk of faith. So look with me at John chapter 14 here, one verse, verse 27. Let me hone in on this verse. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. We live in a world, and you know this, where many place, many place a desire to have uh, world peace, an effort to see world peace, where their idea of world peace is just basically an absence of war and turmoil in the lives around them, and that would filter into their own lives naturally. It's a very real end game to them. That's true to their desire. But unfortunately, often and most often, this hangs out in what Jesus calls the peace of the world, the peace that the world offers, the peace the world gives. But it's not to be where you and I as Christians are to go see worked out in our lives. We don't go to the world for peace. We go to the Christ of peace. His peace is not like the world's peace. The world's peace stands in contrast to that which the Son of God gives. Don't confuse the two. And don't mingle the two together. Don't, don't slide over to, I'm experiencing some of the world's peace and say, therefore, I must be okay with God. Because they're totally different. Because their, their, their function, their origin, their focus, their source is all different. The world cannot know the peace of Christ. And it will never know the peace of Christ apart from knowing Christ personally. So don't blend them together. They come from different sources. This peace Jesus gives is something to be possessed, to take ownership in. It's far more than a determination of your will. You, you can't wake up today and just say, I'm going, by my will, I'm going to have peace. That will get you nowhere. Or maybe to the front door. But yet the first circumstance of life that would hinder that and want to interfere with that peace come into your life, inter intersect your, your walk, your course of being, that peace will go out quickly. We're called to take ownership of it, Jesus says here. It's not just an act of your will, it's an act of God's will in you. So I want us to look at a few truths regarding this peace Jesus describes for us here and for his disciples, um, by the way, which has just been prior introduced by, or has, don't let, your, don't let your hearts be troubled. He's saying, this is what's coming, but before we get there, I'm going to tell you and introduce you to my peace. This is how you're going to let not trouble, let, you won't have a troubled heart because you're experiencing my peace. He will give you the remedy before I give you the the problem. And then we need to realize that it's an amazing gift of a personal peace that God offers through Christ his son to us who are born again in Christ. So first thought, verse 27, peace I leave with you. Jesus says, I'm going to be leaving you soon. 
My incarnation is complete, just about. But I won't leave you comfortless. I know my departure, and we know this for a fact, it would leave them somewhat sad and disappointed, mainly because they, partly because they thought he was going to do something different when he was here. But they would be sad because their, their, their Lord, their, their King is, is going to be leaving them. And this fear, this sadness would open up a lot of opportunity for despair among the disciples. Now, how in the world is something that Jesus is putting in motion to, to go out into all the world, how, how would that be affected if they're in despair from the very beginning? You see, what Jesus is saying, I'm preparing you for this. And you and I need to be prepared for it as well because we live in a world that is, is full of sin and sickness and wicked and evil people. Jesus loves his own. He knows that they will need a deep peace that will enable the disciples and us today to carry on in the ministry that they're being called to, to carry out. Now, if you're in ministry, and most of you are not in the sense of what I am in ministry, but you have your own ministries, but you know that sometimes ministries can be hard. They can be lonely. They can, can especially when, the, when, the, when you stand for the truth and, and the, the, the majority is against you, they don't like to hear what you have to say, and you're standing up for the truth, they, we would deem it a gray area that, hey, we can take it or leave it. And you're saying, no, this is what God's Word says. This is what we stand on. It can be a lonely and, and a sad place. Hate crimes, disrespect, just not having anything to do with you it can be lonely. Ministry is like that. And Jesus wants to prepare them because they too, and like we are even, can be faced with stoning and hatred and being disbanded from the temple, even crucified, even hung on a cross. Jesus, I'm preparing you though. And this gift he's sharing with them, this peace I leave with you, it will enable you, it will strengthen you, it will provide for you a power, a, 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 something in you, the Spirit of God, which we know that, the power to overcome these things that would want to invade you and cause you to lose your peace, to fall. And this peace is the same peace I had, I have. And I'm going to leave it with you. Look at my life as I walked this earth, my three years of ministry plus, and learn from my example. This is a peace that will get you through the crowds. It will get you through the loneliness of Gethsemane. They would not have to go seeking for it or as if it was something hidden. Jesus is not playing a game here. This is my peace. I give it to you. I leave this with you. Not, not you got to go find it or not you got to go do this or do that. It's yours. I'm leaving it with you. You don't have to seek far because it's in you. Through the power of the Spirit of God. He's transferring this gift of the Father to those who remain in in him through the living and powerful Holy Spirit who resides in them or will reside in them from Pentecost on especially. They don't have to work for it. They don't have to purchase it. Can you imagine? The world tries to purchase peace, don't they? Look at all these millionaires and billionaires buying planes and places of resorts and they're trying to find peace ultimately. Look at them. They are just as sad as they can be. The heart is dead in sin. No wonder they're sad. They equate their sadness because of this or not having what they want to have or just a little bit more. The reality is they're dead in their sin. They're sin sick. You can't buy this peace. Remember the, remember the guy who said he wanted the gift of healing? He wanted to buy it? You, you can't buy it these things. They're gifts from God. He's transferring this gift to them. And he's saying that though I will not be physically with you any longer, you can experience the same peace that I have. The exact same peace. It's a weapon for you to fight against the effects of tribulation 
and despair and disappointment. And believe you me, disciples, you're going to get all of that. You're going to be put in prison. You're going to be beheaded because of the truth. And you're going to need a peace far beyond what the world could even offer. This peace will fight away fear, inadequacy. In other words, this special gift of grace is, is now going to be theirs to experience every day of their life. The same way that Jesus had it every day of his life. It wasn't something he pulled out just in Gethsemane. Or this day's on. He was at peace when he was a young lad and, and apart from his mom and dad. Didn't you know that I'd be in my father's house taking care of his business? You tell me that's not peace? All the time he had peace. And this special peace that Jesus experienced was because he was perfectly obeying the Father's will. And, and therein is the key. This peace that Jesus leaves with us even today can only be experienced as we are experiencing the Father's will, his command, or having it seen in our lives. His leaving them would move their peace to a benefit largely due to the association with Christ onto a reality that I can experience this now in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 26. A world where God's name is profaned and despised is all about us. My friends, you need the peace that Christ offers. And I ask you this morning, do you have this peace in your own life? The life that Jesus led, left us, the peace that Jesus left us. And you can, because it's freely offered to you this morning if you are in Christ. Secondly, it's not a place, I'm sorry, it's not just any peace. Jesus said, it is my peace. It's the peace that occupied the life of the Lord. He lived in a fallen world, the same one that we live in. It's been tried and found faithful. It enabled him to sleep in the bow of the boat when all the storms were around him and all the disciples were frantic and worried and scared and afraid. And he said, what? Peace be still. It's a peace that would allow him to remain three days after Lazarus, his very good friend, had died. I'm at peace because God's going to raise, God's going to take care of it. Doesn't matter that I'm three days late, according to their perspective. At peace. He knew the peace of agony of Gethsemane as he walked the Via Della Rosa. My friends, as a son of God, his life was anything but free of turmoil and suffering and sorrow and pain. It was just the opposite. He experienced a level of sins, fallout and effect to the max. And yet he had peace. He had persecution and trials far worse than you and I can ever experience or will ever have in this world. I believe that. Yet he had peace. And that's what he offers. My peace. Because he trusted the Father's will that he would supply him with the necessary strength in this peace no matter what he went through. This peace enabled our Savior to remain focused and undeviating in his devotion to the will of the Father as the angry crowds would grow stronger around him. Crucify him. Run and hide? No. Peace. Because it's the perfect will of the Father. This is why I came. It provided him the ability to confront his enemy fearlessly with confidence and boldness because he was in the Father's will and he trusted his God. Perfect peace was his as he grew in wisdom and obedience from childhood to the cross of Calvary and beyond. Christ's peace is perfect in love and it still remains true for us today that perfect love would cast out all fear. If you want his peace, you must walk in the Father's will this morning. You must be keeping his commandments and loving him with all that you have and all that you are, a commitment that says, I am going to follow you no matter where it takes me, no matter the circumstance that unfolds because of my relationship with my Father. My friends, don't expect Christ's peace to occupy your life if your life is not occupied with him. Jesus said, my peace, I give you. Thirdly, it's a gift. He says, I give it to you. Again, it can't be purchased. 
There isn't enough money or possessions in all the world added together that could buy this peace. Many have tried again, as we said earlier, and they failed. But my friends, there is enough love in one man, Jesus Christ, to give it away. To just give it away. He said, I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. I give it away freely. The same with his peace. I give it away freely. You don't have to buy it or seek it anywhere else. I lay it down freely for you. It's yours. It was mine and now I give it to you. He gives it to each of us if we're in Christ this morning. And I ask you just point blankly, have you accepted this great gift of peace? To neglect this precious gift from our Lord is troublesome at best, even for a Christian. Jesus is reaching out his hand to you and I this morning and, ex and saying, please accept my peace. My peace, I give it to you. To take for my own, to take for your own this morning here in Fame Church in a little town called Mawigwa, Illinois. Not a magic potion, it's a gift of grace through the power and the evidence of the indwelling Holy Spirit for every child of God. So as we prepare this Advent, and um, don't try to make it alone. Don't, don't think that you'll stir up in yourself these, these emotions for his first coming and his second coming on your own strength and your own power. You can't do that. Let's experience his wonder-working power and thank him for making it a free gift for you and I who love him. He says, I give it to you. You can't give something you don't have. And Jesus says, I give you my peace. Fourth and lastly, to point out the difference, Jesus says, not as the world gives do I give you. And again, don't get the two confused. There's a peace the world offers and seeks for, but it stands inferior, much inferior to what God is offering us in Christ. Jesus says, my peace my peace is what will keep you and strengthen you and provide for you in this wicked world in such a way that you'll never really be able to understand it. You try to explain this peace to someone who is going through turmoil of their own, who aren't in Christ, they'll laugh at you. They, have, they, they can't understand it. It's incomprehensible. They'll never understand it because they're not in Him. My friends, the peace the world offers at best is temporary. Jesus' mind's permanent. I give it to you. It's not going to be taken back. There's this tentative uncertain. It's dependent upon conditions that comes into their life. Jesus says, mine's certain. It doesn't matter what circumstance. From the grave to the, to, the, to the cross, perfect peace. The world's is fragile, ready for the junk heap at any time. Throw it away because it is not working for them. At any moment, Jesus stands forever strong because he never fails. He never changes. He is God. And he will never fail you in his peace. And I would be remiss this morning that Paul reminds us in Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace, a different peace, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I bring this scripture in this morning because it's necessary. If there's any hope for you to experience Christ's peace of John 14, verse 27, you must first experience peace with God. There has to be a peace with God before you can experience the peace of God. And that's through the salvation of your soul. Being born again. The world's idea of being born again is just dying. Everyone who dies goes to heaven, don't they? Because God is such a loving God. No. Jesus says you must be born again to enter, enter the kingdom of God. It's through born againness. The world is at enmity with God. And if while seeking Jesus' peace, you're still wanting and you're still lacking, maybe, you should make your calling and election sure that the Bible tells us about. To make certain that you have peace with God. And then cry out for the peace with Jesus offers. You see, sin extinguishes or at least hampers the effect and the ableness of peace for the believer. You might be in Christ, but if you're walking in some effort, an element of sin in your life, you're hampering the peace that Christ offers. Have your sins been forgiven by Christ's work? 
is 1 John 1, 9, which we talked about a long time ago now, probably back, back in March, I would imagine. Is it a powerful go-to verse for you when you're finding yourself unholy in act or thought or deed? 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all of my unrighteousness. That's my go-to verse. Hope it's your go-to verse too. Because then I can experience the peace of Christ that he offers for me. We will not receive the gift that belongs to Christ's bride if we are not in him. And the peace we seek will not find a resting place if sin is hindering us from fully obeying God's commands and trusting his will. It just can't. We who've read the Bible, we know the predictions and the previews of coming days. And it's not pretty. Wars and rumors of wars. Sicknesses that invade the entire globe. Hatred, turmoil, troubles. But Jesus says on the eve of his departure, I'm gonna express my great love for you because I don't want you to have tribulation and troubles in this world that you can't deal with. So I'm going to give you my peace. What an amazing gift. You don't have to go that alone. You don't have to suffer through it. You can rely upon and take hold of his great peace. Fight for this church. Fight for it with all of your being. Allow the peace that he gives you to remedy the troubled heart of fear and of anxiety. Don't allow the frights of this world to steal that from you, to overshadow your peace or worse, remove it. Again, this peace that Christ offers is not dependent upon or affected by ultimately anything the world can throw at us, even death. The Bible says don't fear the one that can destroy the body. Rather, fear the one that can destroy the body and the soul in hell. He's the one to be feared, which is God Almighty. Nothing this world can do. The worst thing they can do is take your life from you and our perspective of things. You're at peace. Because what that means, if you're in Christ, you're going to be with the Father, with the Son, with the Spirit, forever and ever and ever to worship and glorify the Father. If you are so overwhelmed, and I am so overwhelmed by the tribulations of this world, how are we going to let our light shine? We talked about that briefly in Sunday school this morning. How are we going to be any good in our witness in a world that is filled with darkness if our light is so dim they came and tell the difference? How about being the salt of the world? Jesus said that we're the salt of the world. If the salty, salty, salt has lost its saltiness, its savor, what good is it? But it'd be trampled under. If you're in Christ, but you're not salty, and you're not experiencing the peace of God that carries you through these turmoils, the first thing that comes into your life, some circumstance that you can't control or you don't like and you become fearful or anxious or troubled, where's the peace in that? And how are you going to share the world, tell the word of the, of the, of the peace that comes in Christ, that you're, you, you're being the salt. You want to be the salt. And you're not being the salt if you show that you're fearful. That probably didn't come out exactly like I wanted it to. But I think you get the point. Is your heart troubled this morning by world events or family concerns or health issues or even the busyness of Christmas season? Are you discouraged with situations you have no power over? Christ's peace is offered to you this morning. It's a condition of your soul that is supernatural and is to be replaced by any fear that you might have. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can overcome and we can exemplify before the world a peace that Christ had. Now, did, did Christ's peace lead him to have such a joy within him that would express itself with s smiles and jovality and all that all the time? Of course it did not. But see, the, world's, the world says, you're at peace if you've got a smile on your face. That's what I'm looking for. Jesus says, no, it's much more than that. You let trouble come into their life and that smile is going to be wiped off their face very quickly. You let troubles come into the life of a Christian who's trusting in the peace of Christ and they're going to dig deeper into the word of God. They're going to dig deeper into the relationship that they say they have with Jesus Christ. When we wind up this morning here, do you have Christ's peace that he offers? 
Do you have in the depths of your soul the presence of this state being that the Father gives all who belong to him and his Son? Do you first have the peace with God so you can experience the peace of God in Christ? There can only be peace available unlike anything else that we might imagine as it finds its source and is trusting, trusting, trusting in the all-powerful sovereign hand of an almighty God who truly works everything together for the good of his people and for the glory of his name. This Christmas, let's ensure our relationship with the Father is certain and together embrace with all we have this precious gift of our loving Savior. Unholy fear cannot remain where the peace of Christ resides. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Let's pray. Father, in one, one respect, it's hard to describe that which you offer through Christ's peace. It's just a, an inner experience of calmness and trust. But Lord, you, you call us to get there, to be that in Christ, and you offer it to us through him. Help us, Lord, this day. And as we move to communion this morning, Lord, I pray that you would help the reality of the peace we have with Christ, the Christ's peace in us as we approach this table that we do so not radically, but boldly, as it were, but yet humbly, understanding that we don't deserve it. So speak to us, Lord, through this time of communion, we pray in your name. Amen.